All right, hello and welcome back to online English class. Today we're going to be finishing up The Wife of Bath's Tale um, and OTN 9, uh, which is our last text that we're going to be looking at in, uh, the, in Unit 5. So you need to begin the process of preparing for a Unit 5 test, which is going to be early next week. All right, uh, tomorrow in class we're going to be looking specifically at that review guide and talking through how you can begin preparing uh, for that test and what that test will look like. Okay, so. Um, just uh, remember that you need to be uh, preparing for that uh, quarter four essay, preparing for that unit five test, and making sure that you're keeping up with your OTNs um, on a daily basis. All right, so by the end of today, you should have OTN nine complete because we're completing OTN nine today. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into OTN nine uh, and wrap it up. All right, we're going to start with a brief review of everything that we've established up to this point, and then we're going to conclude by looking closely at 1098 to 1216. All right, that shouldn't say 1206, that should say 1216 and 1219 to the end. Okay, so uh, uh, some, some chunks of text that we're gonna look at here. All right, uh, obviously uh, we've already established our SQ3R uh, in a great uh, deal of detail. If you wanna go back and review that, uh, you can certainly go back to earlier video lectures, uh, but essentially um, uh, uh, on the most basic level, this tale reveals and satirizes all right, uh, the wife of Bath's worldview and her value system. Okay, so on the one hand, the tale uh, the the tale kind of works on two levels. On the one hand, the tale satirizes the hypocrisy and uh, and and moral duplicity or immorality of the second estate through its depiction of the carnal and materialistic lusty knight, but it also all right uh, satirizes. Uh, the more amoral materialism and power greedy perspective of the wife of Bath through the characterization of the old hag, right? Uh, in other words, two things are being satirized at once, both the hypocrisy of the male aristocratic class and the radicality of the wife of Bath's response to it. Okay, in other words, both of them seem to be equally corrupt. All right, both of them seem to be motivated by the same essential thing. All right, so uh, up to this point, right, I've got uh, some kind of messy notes here, uh, but let's talk to uh, let's talk about them really quick. Okay, uh, in our first uh, four key passages, uh, some basic things are introduced to us. All right? First of all, where's the tale set? Arthurian Britain. Why? Because it is a kind of ironic parallel of the knights' uh, similarly mythical setting uh, in uh, ancient Athens, All right, centered around Arthur, uh, uh, very much like the knight's tale is centered around Theseus, two sort of idealized uh, members of the male aristocracy, people who are, are characters who are typically in the stories that are about them uh, viewed as uh, ideal masculine uh, leaders. Okay, uh, so what are the characters of the story? Arthur, who is that sort of ideal masculine leader, who is interestingly supplanted by Guinevere. Uh, his power is temporarily subverted by the ladies of the court who become judge and jury uh, to the lusty knight. Um, right, uh, which is a symbol or a, sorry, a motif in the narrative uh, where uh, in which women grasp continually for power and authority instead of passively submitting uh, to the control of the men uh, in their lives, very much uh, like the women uh, in the Knight's Tale do. Okay, uh, think Hippolyta, think Emily. All right. Uh, the lusty knight uh, is characterized as a privileged male aristocrat who is essentially, quintessentially lusty, uh, which is to say that he, instead of being motivated by uh, moral ideals or virtues that help him control himself, uh, he is incontinent, as I said earlier. He is, sim which, is which is to say he is unable to control or unwilling uh, to control his carnal desires, all right? The primary motivator of the lusty knight, uh, despite all the talk about uh, chiv chivalry, nobility, gentility, in the end, right, the wife of Bath sort of uh, uh, nods to in her characterization of the lusty knight that in the end, he, 
is no different than any man or woman uh, in the world that a person is simply motivated by their carnal lust, their carnal desires. And those who are powerful en enough to obtain those desires, right, those are the powerful. Those are the individual, or that's the kind of individual that every person in the end wants to be, right? Who knows this secret? Well, the old hag. The old hag is the double of the wife of Bath. She's characterized as foul, completely and utterly ugly. Why? Because the wife of Bath self-consciously associates herself with a character that defies all of the normal expectations of what a good woman ought to look like. She's old, she's unruly, and she is uh, exerting dominion or power over the night. All things uh, that are incredibly unattractive uh, to the night. Okay? Uh, she tells the knight the secret uh, uh, of what all women want, and by extension, the secret of what all human beings want, which is, in the wife of Bath's perspective, simply power, the ability to satisfy your carnal desires. That's what a human being wants. A human being is not an image bearer of God who was created to pursue virtue and to know God and to experience truth, uh, to worship the Lord, to live in communion with him. Uh, that's not what a human being is for the wife of Bath. Uh, it's much more animalistic. It's much more bestial. A human being is simply an animal that has been designed uh, to attempt to obtain that which they lust after, whatever that might be. And therefore, virtue, morality, and things like chivalry or notions like love are all simply tools that human beings use, all right, in an exploitive relationship in order to achieve the true end that they're actually after, all right? Which means that these concepts are not true in and of themselves or good in and of themselves, not inherently worth living your life in pursuit of, but rather simply convenient tools that help provide access to this power. Now, the wife of Bath's uh, depiction or articulation of this situation uh, is, is interesting because it certainly undermines Christian premises, but it also, interestingly, reflects the worldview and the attitude of the knight, even though the knight doesn't know that he believes that, right? She informs him what his narrative actually means about him. He is a lusty knight. And she, the wife of Bath, and her representative, the old hag, simply lusty women. Now, in order to exert or uh, uh, to uh, illustrate her power over the knight, what does the old wife require the knight to do? This rapist, uh, this man who is used to getting his way, is used uh, to pursuing and satisfying his lust. Well, he requires, uh, she requires him to engage in an unconsensual marriage to her, right? She makes him marry her and then takes him off to bed. This is an expression of pure power, okay? There's no purer expression of power than to make an individual who does not want to do a thing do the thing that you make them want, uh, that, that you want them to do. Why? Because that individual would never consent to that action on their own. They would never willingly do that. So as an expression of her pure power, as an expression of the extent to which she has flipped the gender and political and social power dynamics, the old wife, as a representative of the wife of Bath, forces a marriage on the, uh, on the lusty night. This marriage is not based on love. This marriage is not based on any desire uh, to, to, serve him, uh, to serve him sacrificially or to be served by him sacrificially. Uh, it, it, is not, uh, it, it is not a marriage based on love. It is a marriage that is a reflection of the old wife's power. Okay? The final phase of the tale all right, in which the wife of Bath's double, the old hag, and the lusty knight are in bed together, 
uh, and the lusty knight is is uh, absolutely dreading the act of uh, consummating the marriage, is a way, uh, is a rehearsal of the old hag's power. Very much like the final phase of the knight's tale is a rehearsal, a kind of a, a kind of dramatization of Theseus's absolute power. Right? You guys see the parallels there between the two narratives. Okay, so how exactly does the old wife go about exhibiting her power and authority so extensively to the lusty knight? All right, well, go ahead and turn to lines 1098, and we'll, uh, we'll unpack these ideas together, okay? So uh, in this section of the narrative, uh, I'm not going to be able to read through all of 1098 through 1206, these, uh, this first key passage that we're going to look at, uh, but it's a pretty lengthy passage, but I would encourage you uh, to make sure that you've reread this section uh, of the text before we get into it, okay? So if you need to pause it and reread it, go ahead and do that. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and jump into an analysis, all right? So uh, the section begins, the paragraph begins uh, with the, the wife of Bath, uh, through the, the old hag questioning the lusty knight, she basically asks him this leading question, knowing what his answer will be. Why do, you think that I, wh why do you think I'm so unworthy to be your wife? Okay, Why do you think that this is such a terrible uh, marriage? Why are you so miserable? Okay, And uh, basically, what the old wife, all right, uh, what the old hag is giving the knight an opportunity to do is to articulate clearly his carnal materialism. All right, he he, and he says it just out loud. Okay, no way. It's there's no way that our marriage can be amended. There's no improving this. You can't fix yourself because the problem with you is that you're ugly, and old, and you come from low lineage. You aren't of noble birth. All right, so I'm sorry. You're not wealthy. Okay, I, you know, maybe this, if I were, you know, if I just needed money, I, maybe I could marry you, get some money, wait until you died, and then be free again. But listen, you don't even have money. You're of low lineage, you're old, and you're ugly. What, what, this is completely inappropriate. This is ultimately meant to just be an expression of the knight's materialist carnal worldview, okay? He is articulating his actual value system, right? You are, I cannot uh, be in a, a relationship with you because simply, Right? You're ugly, you're old, and you're not wealthy. You, you, this is completely socially disadvantageous to me. You do not empower me. You do not uh, uh, satisfy any of my uh, appetites, any of my lust. And this is a terrible situation for the young knight to be in. Okay? Right? Now, the, the old wife then says, right, well, I could fix this. If you give me some time, I could fix this if you behave well toward me. All right. Now, what she begins to do in the next 200 lines is to offer arguments as to why she is indeed actually an appropriate wife for the young knight. And all of these arguments, all right, are based on moral ideals. Okay. Based on Christian morality and Christian virtue. Okay, the first section of the old wife's oration challenges the notion that she's not suitable to be the lusty knight's wife because she is uh, comes from low lineage. Well, she argues in the next seven paragraphs. Okay, you might want to read through some of these, but she argues in these next seven paragraphs. Okay, that. Virtue and nobility, right, are not something that a person is born into, but rather gentility and no nobility are connected to the extent to which a person is virtuous, all right? So, in other words, Right? She basically undermines the aristocratic notion that nobility and virtue are passed down from generation to generation among noblemen. Right? She challenges that assertion. She, she reasons that that is not true, and she, concluding with the biblical and Christian understanding of nobility and virtue, says that I am gentle 
An individual is gentle whenever they begin to live virtuously and to waive sin, which is to say to stop sinning. In other words, her argument leads to the conclusion that she is not ignoble or ungenteel or of low birth. She is rather noble, genteel, because she is virtuous, right? So again, she's challenging the lusty knight's carnal materialism with moral idealism, okay? I want you to rec I want you to to job at moral idealism. Okay? The next notion that she corrects in the in the in the next big part of her uh, of her sort of sermon or or uh, or um, uh, sort of oration about moral philosophy uh, to the lusty knight as as she's trying to teach him what it truly means uh, to be to be genteel to be noble. All right, she says you, the the other thing you reproach me for is is the fact that I'm poor. I live in poverty. Okay. But well, then she begins to reason that poverty is not bad. In fact, she reasons that it's something that is actually good for the human soul. Why? Well, Jesus, when he came to earth, he lived in poverty. Why? Because it helped, obviously, uh, in the Christian life, not having too many things, not being obsessed with your uh, worldly possessions is a way of maintaining your focus on God instead of things, right? Right? So poverty is not bad. Poverty is something that can even make you more godly. Poverty can help you imitate the life of Christ, she argues. Poverty can free you from the fear of losing your possessions, which is what, what she's uh, getting at when she's talking about the fact that uh, the poor man doesn't have to worry about the thief. Okay? And then finally, all right, she says, and you also repro reproach me for my old age and my ugly face. Well, my old age and my ugly face are, uh, are, are, are going to help me be more faithful to you, okay? Nothing helps chastity more than old age and an ugly face, all right? In other words, right, she sets up, she, she is using moral idealism that is based on Christian teachings about the value of poverty, about the nature of virtue and nobility, about the value of old age and wisdom over youth and beauty, which fades, about the importance of chastity and faithfulness instead of or over and above sexual gratification. All of these moral ideals challenge what? The lusty knights carnal materialism. But wait a second, who's saying this? The old hag. And isn't the old hag the representative of the wife of Bath? And doesn't, isn't the wife of Bath a carnal materialist who only believes that the purpose of human life is to obtain power? Yes. She is faking this. She doesn't mean a word of this. Very much like the knight uses the appearance of chivalry, uses the appearance of nobility in order to support and protect his access to his power. Very much like Theseus, Arcite, and Palamon do the same thing. The old wife here is simply showing her ability to do the same exact dance. This is manifested to us in our next key passage in which she gives the knight a kind of test. Watch the test. It's very interesting. Choose now, said she, of these things, one of the two, till I die, to have me foul and old too, and be to you a true and humble wife. Okay. In other words, I will be a moral, virtuous wife. Okay but also one that is, uh, that is unable to fulfill your carnal desires because I'm going to be old and ugly and poor. That's option one. Or else you can have me fair and young, right? 
right? A fair young thing. <laughs> and take your chances with the visiting, the adultery that happens at your house because of me, or in some other place, as well may be. So, here, the old hag is confronting the lusty knight with a choice. Carnal materialism, okay, you can have me young, beautiful, but unfaithful and immoral. Or, you can have me old, ugly, but faithful and moral. Okay, so carnal materialism versus moral idealism. Now, what is the correct answer to this question? Well, if the wife of Bath truly meant what she said about virtue and moral idealism, if the wife of Bath's actual intention was to chasten the lusty knight who has proven himself sexually incontinent and therefore a wonderful candidate to be married. It would be just uh, for the, the, the lusty knight to be married to uh, a woman who would not be able to fulfill his carnal desires but would treat, teach him virtue, teach him morality throughout the rest of uh, his life. Right? Wouldn't that be a fitting end to the story. But that's not the wife of Bath's intention, and that's not the old hag's intention either. The lusty knight considers all that he has learned and offers the correct answer. This knight now ponders and sighs sorely too, but finally he said in this way here, my lady, my love, and wife so dear, I put myself in your wise governing. Ding, ding, ding. He does not choose moral idealism or carnal materialism. He simply chooses to give away his agency. He simply gives up power, authority, control. Choose yourself which one may be most pleasing and most honor to both you and me too. I do not care now which one of the two what pleases you suffices now for me. The old hag asked a clarifying question. Then I've got mastery from you, said she, since I may choose and govern all the rest. I have complete sovereignty in our relationship now. I have completely reversed the power dynamic in our relationship. Yes, truly wife said he. I think it best. Kiss me, said she. We are no longer angry, for by my troth to you I will both be, yes, now both fair and good, as will be plain. I pray to God that I might die insane, unless to you I'm good and true, as any wife's been since the world was new, Unless tomorrow I am as fair to see as any queen or empress or lady who is between the east and then the west, do with my life and death as you think best. Cast up the curtain how it is now. See. Okay. In other words, the old hag here promises the young knife uh, young knight, that now that she has mastery over him completely and governs their relationship, now that the power dynamic has been flipped, she has what she desires. She can drop the moral idealism and the virtue uh, preaching. She can give him what he wants and also promise to be uh, fair and good to him. Right? Why does she do that? Because it solidifies her power over him. Right? She gives him more of what he wants and in that way enlists him in his own oppression. Enlist him in his own disempowerment. Once again, right? when does the marriage, right? when does the old wife drop the Moral Idealism Act, it is when she has power. Okay? 
so. In other words, right, why, why does she give this long moral sermon if she doesn't believe any of it? Because she, like the knight, is simply illustrating her ability to manipulate virtue, manipulate the appearance of morality in order to obtain the carnal desire that is her central desire, which is relational power, control. Right? Okay, this is solidified once more at the very end of the narrative in which the wife of Bath offers a ironic prayer to Jesus for husbands that are meek and young and fresh in bed. In other words, husbands that fulfill my carnal desires and then die <laughs> pretty quick. Okay, and shorten the lives, O oh Jesus, of those who won't be governed by their wives. And old stingy niggards who won't spend to them, may God a pestilence soon send. Okay, so this is obviously an ironic prayer, uh, just solidifying uh, the, the, the wife of Bath's sacrilegious approach to all that is sacred, uh, Jesus Christ, and all the moral ideals that uh, the Christian life entail. Okay, in the end... All she wants, very much like the knight, is power and control. Okay, So, to conclude the entire narrative, right? Is the wife of Bath aware of the male second estate's moral hypocrisy? Yes. Is her response any less corrupt? No. In fact... Ironically, even as she rebels against their control, she follows in their footsteps. She follows their leadership. Okay? Even as the second estate okay, pursues the purely carnal desire, the purely carnal desire to control and protect and preserve their power, so too the wife of Bath attempts to arrest that from them by any means necessary. Leading to, again, what Chaucer is suggesting to, is this relationship leads to constant, embittered uh, conflict between those who have power and those who are following uh, the, uh, a leader. Those who are in leadership roles and those who are following those leaders. Now, in any social situation, from age to age, there always will be those who have power and control and privilege, and there always always will be those that are uh, controlled by them to a certain extent, to a certain degree. Even democracies have power dynamics. As much as we'd like to say right, that it's completely egalitarian, there's always leaders, there's always followers. Okay, And if we are going to offer any other uh, form of human behavior except for attempting to find yourself at the top of the ladder at any one point, right? If the whole point of life is not just getting to the top of the ladder, then there has to be a reason why you would give up your power, give up your privilege, use your power and privilege for the benefit of someone less powerful and less privileged than you instead of simply using your power and privilege for your own benefit. There's got to be a reason. You know where that reason comes from? The moral and spiritual foundation of your society. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Ultimately, the hypocrisy of both the knight and the wife of Bath, the corruption of both the knight and the wife of Bath, cries out, for moral and spiritual instruction that will give both leaders and followers, both husbands and wives, both men and women, both rich and poor, both privileged and disenfranchised, a reason to follow good leaders and for leaders 
to chivalrically lay down their lives for those that have been entrusted to them. Without a good reason to do that, we simply have endless vying for power. All right, great parallels between the Knight's Tale and the Wife of Bath's Tale. Uh, hope uh, that you um, learned something, uh, both just about the nature of power dynamics uh, between uh, the privileged uh, and the disenfranchised, uh, but also uh, something specific about uh, Chaucer's literary genius here. All right, hope you guys have an excellent day.